Welcome everybody to Aquarian Pearls, Pearls of Wisdom. And we're so honored today to be um, introducing you to Susan Jacques, who is the worldwide CEO and head of the Gemological Institute of America, the peak education um, board in the, in the business. And we're chatting and learning all about Susan and her life today. So welcome, Susan. Thank you. Delighted so good to, to have you here. with us. Thank um, you. Can I, can I start off asking you where you grew up and went to school and studied? So I actually went, was born and raised in what was Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, in Southern Africa. Uh, my father was British, my mother was Australian, and we um, grew up there. Uh, they had moved from Southern India um, and, and moved to what was Rhodesia. And I was there until I went to study at the GIA 40 years ago in 1980. I studied for my graduate gemologist diploma in Santa Monica. And, and what led you to the jewelry business? Or were you, did you like diamonds from growing up in Rhodesia in Zimbabwe? Or what was it? I loved rocks and shells as a child and would collect them and spent my pocket money on buying little cheap rings on a Friday and um, going and buying tumbled rocks. And so I've always had a fascination for gems. I love mother nature. I love everything to do with nature and the creations that mother nature has blessed us with. Um, but I fell into the jewelry industry. So I actually um, left high school and didn't want to go to co college because I did not know what I would study. And my mother insisted I took a year's secretarial course at the local polytechnic, which I did. And my very first job was as a junior typist at Scottish Jewelers, the largest jewelry company back home. And um, I left for a year, went to live in London for a year. And when I came back, I came back to Scottish Jewelers and took a position in the marketing department. And Peter Winhall, um, who I'm still in touch with today, was the marketing director. And he was studying the GIA courses by correspondence. And so I became intrigued about learning more about gems and jewelry and decided I was perhaps a little um, less uh, desiring of doing this by correspondence, mailing courses back and forth, uh, way before email, way before distance education as we know it today. Um, and so I convinced my parents to let me come study in America. And so I came and did the in-residency program. And, and was that a whole year back then? It's six months. Our graduate six months. Month program is still a six month program. Um, but I brought along some friends from Zim with me and there were actually five of us from Zimbabwe in our class. Oh, how um, fantastic. My boss's daughter and um, a colleague of mine, um, a couple of colleagues of mine, and we really had a great time. It was a wonderful experience and immersion into America through the eyes of Santa Monica is not a bad thing. Fabulous. What a great way to, to come through and learn and live in America. And, and what happened next when you, when you graduated? It was shortly after independence um, in Zimbabwe. And I went back after we graduated with a stop in uh, Washington, D.C. on the way to see all the treasures in the Smithsonian, um, which our GIA governor, Jeff Post, now uh, curates. But a, a just fascinating to see everything we just learned about. Um, and my parents really convinced me to come back to America and find a role in America. They felt I would have much greater success. So I did just that. And I worked at a very small grading lab in uh, Santa Ana, California for a, about 18 months. And that was USGSI, United States Gemological Services, Inc. And we did a tremendous amount of, of grading of colored stones. And that was my big passion. Fantastic, fantastic. And you're, um, I met you when you were um, the CEO of, of Borsheim's, which for, for um, our viewers who don't know, um, Borsheim's is the, 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 the major jewelry business owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway group. And you have the, the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders have the annual general meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. And I think you closed the store and all the, and all the members can go in and shop in their own shop in a way because they're the owners the shareholders and but what was it like being in warren buffett's world you know what it was amazing and my journey to omaha um is one that i share often and it's because of the fact that truly it is all about luck 
and timing and convenience. And what I was very fortunate was Alan Friedman, whose father, Ike Friedman, owned Borsheim's, was a classmate of mine at GIA. And I always tell our students, never negate the relationships and friendships you're making right now, because they can be the trajectory of the rest of your life. And so I was very, very fortunate. Um, I was unfortunate. There was a major recession that came about in the early 1980s. Um, and we were cut from a five day week to a four day week. I was studying for the British um, FGA at the time. And so I, yes. took the time, I took the time to get extra study time. And then we were cut from a three day week and I had to figure out how I was gonna make my rent and my car payment. And I was on the phone with Alan one day and he said, come work in Omaha at our retail store. And I said I would go for one year and I actually ended up more than 35 years. <laughs> so I was 31 years at Borsheim's and 20 of those years I was the CEO. Um, and I was very fortunate um, to have the opportunity. Warren um, asked me to become the CEO back in 1994. And I was in that role until I left to jo join the GIA in 2014. Wow, and, and, and you must have had some extraordinary jewels crossing your path in, in Borsheim's with the kind of customers you would have had too. We did. I mean, we were very, very fortunate. We were one of the largest independent retail jewelers in the United States um, with a very broad client base from local um, shoppers. And there are a tremendous amount of very, very wealthy people in Omaha because of their affiliation with Warren. Many, many people bought Berkshire Hathaway stock when it was a very new and upcoming stock in the 19, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and they've held on to that stock. Um, and so there are a lot of incredibly wealthy individuals, but we catered to everybody and bridal was a very big part of our business. And we also were very big into pearls. I've, I've always been a huge fan of pearls and 7% of our inventory used to be pearls. And for, a, for an independent retail jewelry store, that's a, a lot of inventory. Um, and so I have to say that it was an extraordinary experience and one, when Warren called me down to the office to interview, um, I had no idea why he was calling me down to the office. Um, Ike Friedman had passed away and his son-in-law, Donald Yale, had stepped into the role for a couple of years. And then Donald had resigned and was stepping out. And my friend, Alan, had left the company. And I always thought that um, there was no way in a family business that I would have the expectation to, to land the top role as a CEO. Um, but when he called me down, it's just, I spent half an hour talking him out of it and telling him it was really a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then he persuaded you otherwise. He did Which, persuade so... me otherwise. You know, I, I explained to him I'd never gone to college um, and I didn't think he was aware of that. I was 34 years old at the time. And I was a female in a very male dominated industry. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of female CEOs. And I just, I didn't have the self-confidence that I would be able to be successful. But once he convinced me, um, I surrounded myself with an amazing team of people at Borsheim's, as I have fortunately at GIA, because it's never one person that makes an organization successful. It's the team that you lead um, and inspire, and hopefully they share the passion you have uh, for the success, but most importantly, for the business. And, and as a retailer, it was all about serving that customer and being that final 18 inches of the supply chain. And that was such an extraordinary experience to be able to work with clients and help celebrate their most incredible milestones in life. And it doesn't get much better than that every day. Oh, how fabulous, really, really amazing. And 7% and, um, of, of, just to talk about pearls for a moment, 7% of an inventory of, a, of an independent retailer, it's usually, I think, 2% or something. So that was that made you very pearly at Borsheim's, I'm glad to say. And I remember my dear friend, Sonny Setti from, from Tara, who was one of your suppliers, I'm sure. He, um, yeah, he loved coming to Omaha and said it was an amazing business. And all the folks there were absolutely amazing to work with. And it was like a, the, 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 the best times in the business, I'm sure. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the Berkshire weekend was an extraordinary opportunity to wait on clients from around the world. They all yeah. were Warren. And so they came to Omaha the first weekend in May um, to be part of the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders weekend. And we were very fortunate. We were one of the 
showcases that uh, we had a private shareholder event on the Friday evening. We had a, a private event on the Sunday. We always timed it um, outside of our regular hours because we never wanted to indicate to our regular clients that they were less important than our shareholders. Sure. Um, but truly the incredible people we had the opportunity to meet and to wait on um, really is, is incredible. And it continues today, regrettably this year with COVID, Warren did cancel the shareholder meeting in person. It's virtual now. And he's made the announcement the same for 2021. Um, hopefully they'll go back to it. Uh, one of the last shareholder meetings, I think there were almost 40,000 people in attendance. So this is not a little shareholders meeting where a few people show up. This is, it has become almost a cult. Yeah. Um, following Warren and hearing, having the opportunity to sit all day in the, in the convention center and listen to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett in person, um, talking about things that are concerning to the shareholders. It's a happening and, and, and it's so relevant too, isn't it? I, I do, I do um, hope and pray too that everybody gets back to real life gatherings again but yes and susan at, and you left there to go to to be the ceo and run the gemological institute where you'd studied all those years ago and could you explain what the gia does to our to our, those who are going to watch this who who don't really know what it what it does or what it means so the GIA is a remarkable organization in the gem and jewelry industry, and we have a very simple mission. And our mission is to ensure the public trust in gems and jewelry. So everything we do is mission-based. How do we continue to protect the consumer as they make purchases of gems and jewelry? And we start with research. Everything that we do is underpinned by the extraordinary research that we do at GIA on colored stones, on pearls, as well as on diamonds. Um, we, we grow lab-grown diamonds for research, we, we do field gemology trips to mines around the world, we visit the pearl harvesting sites um, to get first-hand knowledge that we can then share. And that is all then translated into our courses, um, and we do distance education and on-campus courses. Um, so education is the reason we were originally founded 90 years ago. So we're celebrating our 90th anniversary. Uh, we were founded in 1931 by um, Mr. Shipley. And three years later, he founded the American Gem Society. So we were founded to professionalize the jewelry industry and educate jewelers. And the AGS was the guild that those jewelers could belong to. So we have the same founders and our sister organizations. And we um, then from education, we also have our laboratory services so providing diamond grading reports, colored stone reports, um, colored stone traceability reports are brand new that we're just introducing together with a, a new pearl classification report that we've just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we do work with um, amazing, amazing products that come through. Um, most of all the very important gems that are traded in the world come with a GIA grading report. Uh, and we have nine grading labs around the world. Um, we also do a tremendous amount of instrument development. So special gemological instrumentation that we use internally in our labs and also instrumentation that we use, um, you know, and sell. So the loop was actually um, first created uh, by Robert Shipley's son, Robert Shipley Jr. Um, and col um, colorimeters that we use to measure color in diamonds, for example. Um, we we're on many iterations of that. That was first brought about in the 1950s. So there are instruments that continue to develop as technology develops. Um, one of the instruments that we brought to market a couple of years ago was the GI IB100, when the lab-grown diamonds were entering the marketplace and there were very big concerns about lab-grown diamonds being mixed with natural stones. And so we devised a handheld device that sits on your desk that can de detect the difference between whether it's lab grown or whether it is natural. So um, instrument development is a very important part of what we do as well. That is, that, that's an amazing um, overview. Thank you. And I know for us in the pearl business and the gentleman I've worked for, Nicholas Paspaley, and had the honor to work with Salvador Asael and Robert Wan and the, the fabulous jewel mayor, Granelec family, um, everybody, everybody really can't trade properly without GIA certificates and validations. And my my nephew Charlie Barron, he's a pearl dealer in London. He's 25. 
he um, went to the GIA in London. And so, so many people I know um, have, have benefited from it. It's an amazing organization. Yeah. Thank you. Susan, thank you so, so much. I've, I've got to ask you one final question is, what message would you give to the, to the young people who like yourself were interested or contemplating the jewelry industry? if they're sort of 18, 19 years old now, and they're thinking, oh, maybe jewelry's for me. What would you, what would you say to them as a, a message of hope and positivity? I'm always eternally optimistic, and I think our best days are ahead. I think that jewelry has been a part of adornment um, for forever, since the first person millennia ago picked up a shell, put some twine around it, and put it around their neck. And I think that since that time, um, there have been such extraordinary discoveries, new discoveries are still out there. I think that it's a real time of evolution and, and change within the industry. I think the, the past year of the pandemic has accelerated change dramatically. But there are so many different opportunities in this industry, not just the traditional opportunities perhaps of wholesaler or retailer that our, our people are perhaps more familiar with, but so many great design opportunities, opportunities in so many different fields, and also the support areas. So GIA has a, a huge staff of 3,000 people around the world, um, but our HR staff and our IT staff and our finance staff and, and people become passionate. And I think follow your passion. That's the, the, the golden rule I've always told my three sons is follow your passion in life and do what you really want to do because that's how you'll end up with a very fulfilled life that you're proud to have lived. Fantastic. Susan, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's been a real, um, a great privilege and honor to, to speak with you today and wish you well for, for your 2021. Thank you. And the same to you. And it's been a privilege and an honor to be included in your webinar. So thanks so much. Take good care. Be safe Thank and healthy, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.